I'm Grant. And I'm Leah, and we live in Washington State. We found a great gray owl nest this last spring that our whole family spent a lot of time observing. We would like to share photos and videos and interesting behaviors that we learned by observing this special species. It all started the spring of 2020 when we spotted a great gray owl hunting in a field. We were thrilled. There had been no official sightings of great grays in that area for a long time. In the entire state of Washington, the Audubon organization estimates that there are only between 20 and 40 nesting pairs of great gray owls. After that first sighting, we wanted to see that great gray owl again and see if there was a nest. Our dad went around and visited with several landowners and requested permission to search for the owl on their land. They all graciously agreed and we started looking for a nest. We found several different snags that we thought would be good nesting sites, but no nest. Finally, we were out searching for the owl. Suddenly, our dad whispered, she's sitting on that snag. We were pretty excited. We crept through the bushes and had a look, and there she was. Owls do not build their own nests. They either take over an old nest from another bird or a man-made nesting spot. In the case of great gray owls, typically they nest in the top of a large broken off snag, or sometimes they take over a goshawk or a red-tailed hawk nest, or use man-made platforms. Their nest needs to be at least 20 feet off the ground and large enough to hold the mother owl and their offspring. So broken off dead old growth trees are the perfect spot for them. This is another reason to do what we can to protect old growth forests. It is an important habitat for the great grays. The great gray owl is a bit picky in the area where they choose to nest. They need the nest to be located in dense forests to help protect the young from other raptors. But they need meadows or fields nearby so that they can easily hunt for mice, gophers, and voles. Voles are their food of choice though. They prefer meadows with a few scattered low trees or snags that they can hunt from. We often see them sitting on fence posts on the edge of pastures waiting for the perfect bull to come along. We stayed very far from the nest as long as the female was incubating the eggs because we wanted the female to feel comfortable and undisturbed. Finally, after a month, we observed that the owl changed her behavior and her posture on the nest. She kept poking her head down into the nest so we assumed that at least one egg had hatched. At that point, we set up a blind at a respectful distance from the nest so that we could observe and photograph. Within a day, we saw one little head poke over the edge, and a couple days after that, we saw two little heads. At first, the babies were covered with white down feathers. Great grays typically lay two to five eggs. Their eggs are solid white and about the size of chicken eggs. The incubation time is anywhere from 28 to 36 days. And during this time, the mother we observed rarely left the nest. Although we did see her leave for a few minutes a couple times. The first owl in the nest we observed hatched her after 28 or 29 days. The second one hatched one to two days later. For the first few days, we were very excited with the tiny glimpses we would get of the hatchlings. But after three or four days, they were too big to really hide. For the first three weeks or so, the mother continued to stay on the nest nearly all the time. And the father did all the hunting for both the mother and the offspring. He was one busy dad. We observed that after about a week and a half, the babies were big enough to swallow some of the prey whole. During these three weeks of brooding, the mother was very attentive. One day, we had a real downpour, and the mother provided a shelter for the babies, and they were able to stay dry under the feathers. She would spend hours preening the owlets, it almost seemed like you could feel the love that she had for the owlets when she was preening them. She somehow taught the owlets to keep the nest clean. They would throw debris over the edge on a regular basis. She even trained the owlets early to poop over the edge of the nest. The one exception to her constant attentiveness those first three weeks after they hatched was that once in a while she would fly away and get a drink from a nearby stream. Before she left, the dad would come land nearby. Then he would sit on the side of a snag while she was away and keep close watch on the owlets. We could tell that she had gone to the stream because when she came back, she would be dripping wet. After about three weeks, the mother joined more and more in hunting and left the nestlings unattended for longer and longer periods of time. 
During their fourth week of life, she would spend quite a bit of time perched on a tree nearby, just watching them from a distance. The parents were very alert to the surroundings though. If another raptor or a raven flew over, a parent would be on the nest in an instant. The owlets spend most of these days stretching and stretching their wings. Sometimes we wondered if one of them would fall off or get pushed off by the other. We have heard that sometimes that does happen. After about a week of being mostly unattended, the first owlet fledged. The next morning, when we visited the nest, there was only one owlet remaining. The mother was perched in a tree, glancing back and forth between the nest and a spot on the ground. She was keeping watch over both owlets. The fledged owlet was about 300 feet downhill from the nest and quite well disguised in the bushes. Two days later, the mother was refusing to feed the remaining owlet. That owlet kept standing on the edge of the nest and flapping its wings. When it fledged, the mother flew in to check on the fledgling as soon as it hit the ground. Within a few hours, the second fledgling made its way to where the first fledgling was. In the meantime, the first fledgling had started climbing trees. This phase is called branching. It clawed its way up the side of the tree to perch on low branches. The flightless fledglings would jump between branches and sometimes even to the ground to climb different trees. The fledglings typically spend two to three days on the ground before branching. This is their most vulnerable time because when they are on the ground, everything is their predator. Then they spend one to two weeks branching while learning to fly. They are around the size of a small crow when they fledge. The parents have to continue to feed the fledglings for a few months. They brought food to them in the trees where they perched and fed them just the same as they did in the nest. A convenient aspect for us was that the fledglings were screeching a lot. So it made it easy for us to find them for a couple weeks. They continued the constant screeching well past when they learned to fly. And we enjoyed the easy birding for those few weeks. The mother owl left the area a few days after the owlets fledged. I guess she dedicated about seven weeks to incubating and brooding in the nest and she was ready for a break. This is typical behavior for female great gray owls. The dad is then left to feed them for the rest of the summer and into the autumn. At this point, the owls are very difficult to find. We feel very fortunate whenever we spot them. The immature owls are now five months old. At our last sighting, they appeared as large as the adults, and the familiar markings of the great gray owl were distinct on them. The two siblings still stay very close to each other, and even though they don't screech very often, they still screech like they did when they first fledged. They won't separate from each other until it snows. Spending a summer with a family of owls has been like a dream come true for us. We have learned so much by observing them, and we have developed a deep appreciation for them. We hope that the story of our owl family inspires an appreciation in you also for this magnificent gray ghost of the forest.